Assalamu alaikum, sabah al-khair. Very warm welcome to you, excellencies, dignitaries, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rebecca McLaughlin Duane, and I'm your master of ceremonies for today on behalf of Indian Expressions. The team and the managing director, Malin Menon, and the presenters, supporters, and our crucial sponsors are delighted to welcome you to this prestigious Asian Business Leadership Forum series. The ABLF series is an ambition realized. The event is really geared towards addressing evolving economic developments through the twin processes of introspection and inspiration. We are wholeheartedly committed to encouraging collaborations and conversations between Asian corporations who are really seeking to either expand their global footprint or bolster their global business equity. So after the resounding success of last year's grand ceremony, the ABLF Awards 2012 are officially being launched by the Knowledge Congress. The Congress will be the first in a series of forums and events that will archive and generate information on the three aforementioned sectors within Asia. They will be hosted at iconic cities right across the region, not least Indonesia and Oman. After the success of last year's ABLF Awards in New Delhi, the inaugural Knowledge Congress of the ABLF series was held in Dubai recently. It reflected a global shift as established and emerging economies across the world pursue the creation, evaluation and efficient use of knowledge for growth. The premise around the ABLF series is to address the growing need for collaboration and conversation among Asian corporations looking to extend their businesses' footprint and build global business equity in these times of accelerated economic change and opportunity. Some of the participants at this year's Knowledge Congress were His Highness Sheikh Nayan bin Mubarak Al Nahyan, UAE Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research, Mr. Kamal Nath, Union Minister of Urban Development and Parliamentary Affairs, Government of India, Mr. T.K.A. Nair, Advisor to the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Naveen Jindal, Chairman of Jindal Steel and Power Limited, Dr. Chatib Basri, Chairman of the Indonesia Investment Board, Mr. Yusuf Ali, Managing Director of the UAE-based MK Group, Dr. P. Muhammad Ali, Vice Chairman of the Oman-based construction giant, Galfar. His Highness has been a true guiding light for this initiative, and it's been through his encouragement and support that the ABLF platform has risen in such significance since the inaugural awards in Delhi last year. Sheikh Nahyan has been instrumental in forging a new path for the UAE's education system, making the Emirates a new hub for higher education and scientific research in the region. And so I kindly call upon His Highness to come to the podium and deliver a keynote address. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be a lively and enlightening uh, forum. I extend a very special welcome to my dear friend and brother, uh, Kamal Nad. As uh, the very name of your ABLF Knowledge Congress implies, you will be always concerned with the most fundamental driver of the global economy, namely, course, education. The best outcome of your deliberations today would be, I'm sure, progress and development for Asia, and I'm also sure that you have recognize the wisdom of this thought. Educating, educating the individual is the country's most valuable investment. It represents the foundation for progress and development. Those are the wise words of our president, uh, the president of the Antarab Emirates, His Highness Sheikh Khalid bin Zayed Al Nahyan, as well His Highness uh, the UAE Vice President and Prime Minister and Ruler of Dubai, 
Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum and His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and the Deputy Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. I am confident that this forum will help strengthen Asian economies. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Wish you all the best and wish you a day of imaginative and productive thinking. Thank you very much. It is the inaugural ABLF Knowledge Congress, and you're very welcome. Welcome to all of our panelists. Dr. Kamali, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. The role of the government and the private sector uh, and, and the business sector, and how they, they, they will work together, and, and the regulation that sometimes hinders or supports uh, are some of the key challenges that we have to look for if we're going to go and, and go further as we, we move ahead. Uh, the, and, and to look at the opportunities uh, that are out there for Asia and the outlook for the Asia for the next three years. I mean, what is it we have to be uh, weary about or what we have to be aware of, what we have to take advantage of? How do we leverage where it, Asia stands today for the next three to five years, given the economy uh, status today? So let me start by Dr. Basri to my left. Thank you very much. Indonesia has become the 50th largest economy in the world with the slowing down of the global economy due to the Euro debt crisis, with the slowdown of the US economy, the Asian Development Bank produced a report about a couple months ago uh, with the title is the Asian Century. Mm -hmm. And there are three major poles of growth, which is all of us, I think, sitting around the table. The first one is the greater South Asia which is, of course, India and also other countries in South Asia. The second one is the greater East Asia, which is China, Korea, and Japan. And the last but not least, there is one indispensable country that is simply you cannot miss. It is the greater Indonesia, which is ASEAN. Why I call it this the greater Indonesia? Because 48% of the ASEAN economy is actually Indonesian economy in terms of size. 42% of the ASEAN population, it is in Indonesia. I think, Nareen, we come to you now, and uh, you have had uh, uh, a lot to deal with, and, and uh, given the, the part uh, of steel that you come from, I think you have uh, some very strong perspective uh, to give us. Nareen? Our company, Jindal Steel and Power Limited, it's basically into steel making, mining, power generation, and we have the experience of, a lot of experience working in India, so if I was to speak about uh, India, uh, most of our issues are, are local. You know, we have to handle the local environment because India is a country with 2% of the world's land with 17% uh, of its population. So it's a heavily populated country. So if you want to do a large project, there are you know, issues of getting land and takes a long time for getting clearances and everything. Uh, Neval, uh, I know you have the infrastructure uh, uh, background and I, we are very keen to hear from your side as to what do you think uh, the opportunities are now. Okay. Uh, Naveen's sort of given you a in brief introduction into India, so I won't repeat that. But I believe that uh, the world economy is at a very fascinating stage because if you look back, high GDP growth rates have only come off the back of significant infrastructure development. Consumption economies can only sort of uh, project GDP growth rates at low uh, single digits. It takes uh, the big infrastructure investments and hence the development of ancillary industry around it to project it to the high eights and above 10 uh, GDP growth rates. And that's what uh, the Asia Middle East region is currently poised at. So Dewey, from your perspective? Indonesia that uh, from the global con uh, competitiveness report, uh, 
the infrastructure in uh, ranking of Indonesia is in the 78. So this is uh, the, the the problem, and uh, but we see this is the opportunity. Uh, whoever the government uh, in the next election, I think uh, uh, they will fight to improve this infrastructure because from the infrastructure. Uh, the economic growth that now happened always positively uh, since uh, uh, 1999. Uh, it will be uh, better in the future, I think. And then we have also the opportunity of cement uh, con consumption per capita that's still low among the, uh, the, uh, the country in, in Southeast Asia, even that is lower than Vietnam, uh, lower than Thailand. Uh, yeah, it, it is uh, just uh, 90, 99 kilogram per capita. So I think this is the opportunity in the in the future <coughs> for the infrastructure. Thank you for being uh, with us on this session and thank our panel member. Thank you very much. <laughs>
all over all over asia because there aren't very many waterways uh, opportunities in uh, most of asia so that's because railroads consume one fifth of the energy that of the road transport so that's why it needs to be encouraged and ports we can all learn from each other's experiences i think that's most important and through a forum like this when we are interacting uh, with each other maybe we have done something very good in india that you can learn from something you may have done we could learn from that so i think such exchange of ideas and successful models of uh, private public partnership is something we can all learn and benefit from thank you uh, my colleague fatma again she spoke about the ports and then the potential of of having uh, such infrastructure within uh, the coast of oman is endless in fact it is uh, a bit late but it's not too late uh, oman uh, geographically uh, located in an excellent uh, uh, place uh, oman has uh, the sea of oman uh, the uh, gulf the uh, arab sea the uh, indian ocean oman historically uh, is an important uh, player within the uh, uh, ancient tra trade uh, Uh, and uh, I'm specifically uh, talking about the Silk Route. One of the first things we have to do is to, as leaders in our uh, various countries at all levels, is to accept and realize that certain infrastructure cannot be done on a model with private investment. For example, water supply. The real problem today is not the awareness, is not the capital, because at the end there is enough available because the highest savings rates in the world today are in the very regions where you need infrastructure what is really missing and which most people <clears throat> not a single forum has ever mentioned and that is the attitude to get it done telecom operators have a tremendous tremendous request for capital they need to make huge capital investments at a time when the margins are growing smaller because of competition and that's a, that's an observable fact prices are going down margins are going down but the risk is going up how the risk is apportioned and who between the two parties the private and the public bears which risk is the challenge of any public private partnership be it in infrastructure or telecommunications so we just have to figure out a way where people can come together and figure out a framework in which the execution challenges are, are minimized and therefore the risk reward equation for the private sector is more balanced in order to get uh, infrastructure development expedited in the country let's get straight to it our discussion about energy in our closing panel discussion please welcome ranjeev luthra but let me start with um in light of the fukushima disaster nuclear disaster is nuclear power a boon or a bane and i'll start with the leaders of the pioneers of nuclear power uh, the americans and we are fortunate to have um, mr hutler who's the vice chair of pillsbury one of the top law firms of the world fukushima was certainly a disaster for japan and for the japanese people who's property and whose health was affected by it so severely but as for nuclear energy itself i would say it's neither a boon nor a bane i would say that it is simply an event that hopefully with the passage of time will prove to be a useful development for nuclear energy and that it will cause the industry and the governments involved to develop a stronger set of safety mechanisms for nuclear energy to make it an even safer source of energy in the future but will fukushima stop nuclear power i think the answer to that is a, is a clear no thank you thank you steve uh, trevor let's have your view on this area the safety standards Um, around the next generation of nuclear power stations have massively improved um, over the generational steps that have taken place over the last 30 40 years i mean a lot of the nuclear power stations uh, well most of them in fact were built a long time ago 
Um, but in the broader context, I think we just need to be very well aware of the, the, the raw power demands that the planet requires, um, whether it's developed countries, emerging economies, um, it is absolutely staggering. And frankly, we need every bit of power generation capability uh, uh, that we can muster um, at a cost that we can economically uh, finance and, uh, and it makes sense for the country. And uh, I think we've got to be much, much more thoughtful and integrated in the way we look at all sources of power generation. India is morely dependent on thermal energy. Yes, this also forms part of that uh, energy basket. And we are going a big way in the renewables. I think nuclear energy is uh, critical for uh, India's development. For India, nuclear is, is a long-term sustainable strategy to de-risk ourselves from the uh, reliability security concerns of oil and gas. Coal is fine, uh, but to de-risk ourselves from, uh, from the risk of uh, oil and gas, nuclear and renewables. Renewables has the added benefit of distributed generation, which is key in, in the Indian context. Mr. Isa Abdullah Gurel Sahib, let's get your thoughts on the subject. Nobody thought that the UAE will go for nuclear with all its abundant of oil and gas reserve that they have. A, a nuclear will be one part of the whole uh, energy requirement or production side, but very much uh, stressed by the other speakers that safety is important. And one critical thing that we should also remember that with this source is carbon-less production. Saying that, that we should always have not only one segment, I mean, not focus only on nuclear or uh, fuel or other things. I think there is one important thing that people f try, I mean, I don't know, forget about it, but we should focus on that, is going green. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panel on their discussion about energy. We look forward to seeing you next year. All the very best. Thank you very much. The ABLF series offers a common platform for Asian business leaders to forge new partnerships, and such an initiative deserves support through the ABLF series. Well, we support a ABLF because uh, we believe that it's an interesting platform uh, to uh, promote the idea of infrastructure development across the Asia region. This ABLF event is a very important function, uh, given the fact that uh, Asia is expected to lead the economic growth and uh, play a very important role in the coming years. And I'm really grateful all the speakers have very nicely presented themselves and good points were discussed. And uh, again, congratulate the uh, Indian Express.